The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome two of my good buddies back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. It is 2022, and we are going to talk about everybody's favorite topic, the dollar. I've got Brent Johnson and Peter Schiff here to go back and forth in a good, respectful debate. Gentlemen, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. Thanks for having me. Yep, George, thanks for having us on. All right. So, Brent, let's start with you. Uh, we were talking earlier before we hit the record button, and you're still pretty bullish on the dollar for 2022. So can you outline kind of your view and why you have that view? And then just for the audience, I want to be specific here. So we'll probably talk about consumer price inflation domestically in the United States, but we're going to try to compartmentalize this conversation. So when, we're first start, uh, when we first start off talking about the dollar, this is the dollar on the DXY. So really relative to a basket of other currencies. We'll start there and then get more nuanced. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm bullish on the dollar, whether you call it the DXY or whether you want to use, I mean, the DXY is only about five or six different European currencies, or it's got the yen in there as well. But uh, I'm bullish on the DXY and I'm bullish on the dollar versus, you know, just about any other fiat currency you, you can think of. Um it, it's, it's had a really good run over the last six months. It's probably due for a little bit of a pullback, which won't surprise me at all. But uh, I think as we get further into 2022, we're just going to see more of the same of what we saw this year. And I expect the dollar to go higher. Yeah. Why do you think the dollar's gone from, was it 90 to 96 lately? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of for all the reasons I've pointed out before is there's just no other game in town. Um, you have to have dollars if you want to operate in the real world. Um, and that's just, you don't have to like it. You don't have to like the dollar, but if you want to operate on the global stage, you need dollars to do it. Uh, demand far outstrips supply. And I, I know that people will say they're increasing the supply and that's fine, but the demand is increasing even more. And so if you've got demand outstripping supply, you get the price rising. And, you know, all the other currencies are increasing supply as well. So if supply is equal, you know, it comes down to demand and there's just no other currency that has the same level of demand as the dollar. And is there that much demand because of the dollar denominated debt? So where I'm going with this is when you look at the dollar denominated debt outside the United States, and then you look at countries like Europe, as an example, locking people down again, that means they're not producing stuff. That means less dollar denominated cash flow for the corporations that have the dollar denominated debt and therefore they've got to sell whatever's on their balance sheet, maybe their local currency, and that makes the dollar go higher. Is that the shortage of dollars or the demand? Yeah, I mean, that, that, yeah, that, that's a big part of it. You know, that when there's less circulation, velocity is low, no lending's taking place, uh, it just makes it harder to get those dollars. Okay, great. Peter, what's your position? Well, you know, I think we both agree that uh, fiat currencies are all going to lose purchasing power in 2022. Uh, the question is, which one will lose the most? And that's where I disagree with Brent. I, mean, I think the dollar is in a lot of trouble going into 2022. Uh, sure, it, it caught a bit of a bid in 2021, but I think what supported the dollar was the same false premise that was suppressing gold. You know, gold was down a bit uh, in 2021 as well, even though inflation surprised all the experts by not only not being transitory, uh, but being much hotter uh, than any of the experts expected. Now, normally you would think that that would be bearish for the dollar and right. bullish for gold. After all, the dollar lost a lot more purchasing power than everybody expected, yet the result was a stronger dollar and weaker gold. And, and I think that's because the markets are anticipating this battle between, you know, with inflation, that the Fed is going to get tough, that they're going to withdraw the stimulus on a quicker timetable than the markets expected. They're going to start raising rates sooner than the markets expected, maybe even raise them a little bit more than the markets expected. And this whole idea that we're going to have this tight money and this hawkish Fed, I think, has been supporting the dollar and, and keeping a lid on gold, even though this is absurd because less loose is not tight. I mean, we're not going to have tight money. We're going to have easy money. Will it be slightly less easy than it's been? Maybe for a while until the Fed has to turn it up and, and open the spigots even wider, which I expect to happen in 2022, despite the fact that inflation is not only not going to subside,
but probably get worse. I mean, uh, Brett is talking about this demand for dollars. We got the merchandise trade deficit numbers. I think it was October or November, October probably yesterday. And it was the worst deficit in history, 98 point something billion dollars in a single month. And what was even worse about this record shattering monthly trade deficit was that exports plunged as imports surged. So we're sending out less stuff. We're buying more stuff than ever before. The world does not need dollars because we don't make anything that the world needs to buy. Americans need foreign currencies because we need to buy what everybody else makes. This is going to be the worst year in history, 2021, for U.S. trade. By far, we're going to shatter the record uh, from just prior to the 2008 financial crisis. I think the 2022 trade deficit is going to be even larger than the 2021 deficit. Now, what has been propping up the dollar? Because normally these type of horrific trade deficits would sink a currency. But what's happened is our trading partners have been reinvesting their surpluses in U.S. financial assets. Now, I don't think there's going to be a big appetite for U.S. Treasuries in 2022 when you've got yields on a 10-year Treasury at 1.5%, maybe 30-year Treasuries, barely, not, not even 2% when you've got official inflation at 7%, unofficial, more realistic inflation at 15% and rising, I see very little demand for any type of dollar denominated debt. There has been demand for US equities. I think that's where this trade surpluses have been recycled into US stocks, predominantly the big tech stocks, but I think given the historic overvaluation that exists today between the U.S. stock market and pretty much all the other stock markets around the world, it doesn't make sense to me that the world will continue to recycle its massive trade surpluses back into overpriced U.S. stocks when they could buy much better valuations in their own country. So I, I think you're going to see a weak dollar as the trade uh, surpluses or foreign trade surpluses are not reinvested. Those dollars end up hitting the foreign exchange markets. The dollar goes down. As the dollar goes down, that actually accelerates U.S. inflation. We've had huge increases in consumer prices in 2021 with a strong dollar that has been helping us, which has been keeping a lid on prices. Imagine how much worse it's going to get when the dollar starts to fall, really putting upward pressure on prices, particularly the imports. And a weak dollar is going to send the trade deficits even higher. All of this is going to make the dollar even less appealing. Uh, it's going to weigh on the economy. It's going to result in the Fed uh, you know, reversing course uh, and moving from being less loose to even more loose than they were before. So I, I, a lot of downside risk for the U.S. dollar, upside for inflation. And of course, I think gold is also going to make a big move in all currencies, in particular the dollar, as the markets come to terms with the fact that the Fed is not only not going to win a war against inflation, it's not even going to fight the war. It's going to surrender without a fight because it knows it can't win. Yeah. Peter, do you think that for a foreign investor, and I'm just thinking about bonds. Let's just talk about the 10-year treasury. It, you're, I mean, it's obviously negative real rates when you look at a domestic investor, but do you think it's slightly different for a foreign investor because their expenses aren't denominated in dollars? Like if you're someone in Turkey, as an example, uh, and you believe that the Turkish lira is going to continue to lose purchasing power to the dollar, even if there is a CPI print of, let's say, 7%, uh, do you think treasuries could still be attractive to that investor because they're, wow. you see what I'm saying there? Yeah, well, you're taking the example of Turkey, which obviously almost anything looks uh, better to Turkey <laughs> than, than the lira. But of course, you know, the Turks can choose from other currencies. They can buy the euro. They can buy the yen. They can buy the Swiss okay. franc. They can buy gold. Why, why, but, but why aren't they? Why aren't they buying the euro and the yen and the Swiss well, franc? Well, I don't know what they're. I don't know what they're buying in Turkey. You know, but Turkey is a tiny country. I mean, if you want to think about what's going to happen, think about the Europeans. Or think about you know the Japanese or much larger economies. What are they going to do? You know, because when you think about 
U.S. Treasuries from the perspective of an American, right? I don't really know any American citizens who are buying U.S. Treasuries. I can't right. find anybody who will admit, say, hey, are you buying any Treasuries? I mean, nobody wants to buy them because the yield is so low. I mean, right. who's going to invest for Peter. 10 years? For, let, me, let me make this point, for 1.5%. But from a foreign perspective, it's even worse because at least an American can say, okay, it's low return, but it's low risk, right? I'm going to put my million dollars in U.S. Treasuries, and at least I know I'm going to have a million dollars. Yes, I'm only going to make you know, 10000 15000 a year in interest, but at least my million dollars is safe in that I'm not going to lose any dollars. But think about this from the perspective of a European. I'm going to put my, my, my euros in the U.S. Treasuries for a tiny amount of yield, yet I'm taking all the risk. What if the dollar falls against the euro? Yeah. I'm, I'm putting all this money at risk and I'm getting no yield. So from a, from a perspective of a foreign investor, U.S. Treasuries are an even worse investment than from an American perspective. And no one in America wants to buy. Yeah, because you got that FX risk. OK, Brent, what do you think there? Do you want to no, talk I, about well, yeah, I, I Well, before we get to that, I just want to ask Peter. I mean, I know you travel to Europe. You have friends in Europe. You have clients from Europe. How many European individuals are buying European sovereign bonds? Well, I think they have the same problem over there. I don't think I don't think they're buying those either. I mean, I I don't well, think so people want to buy so, bonds anywhere. But, so but you have why, to look at why, who's why got is, the big why is the dollar. But 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 I think it's important to point out that yes, we have the deficit, both twin deficits, right? But Europe's got fiscal deficits, and but they don't, the reason the reason they don't they have do a have trade. Fiscal, they don't have a trade. Is. But Peter, they, 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 Peter, they don't have the option of having a trade deficit because they're not the global reserve currency. The U.S. doesn't have an option either. We can't run a globe, We can't run a trade surplus and have the global reserve currency. This is not a. Well, we used to have bug. surpluses. This, wait, wait, that's this is ridiculous. Not a bug. This, used, is, this is. A, Brent, we used to have was, surpluses. We had big that's surpluses. Right. What, what, what were the dates that happened, Peter? What were well, the we had them. We had them in the 1980s. You know, they went That's away. Right. At and, some and, point. and then, and then, and then, what happened in the mid 80s? Why did they have to lower the dollar? Because the, the, the world, because the, the world was starved of dollars, and so they had to artificially weaken the dollar. The dollar didn't just fall because nobody else wanted it. They had to artificially weaken the dollar on the Plaza Accords because the rest of the world needed dollars. Right. But we remember we had very, very high interest rates that were tempting people into those dollars. And that's because the dollar was at an all time record low in 1980. So the dollar had but on, a a on, a, on a relative basis. We have really high interest rates right now. No, we don't. We have we have low. Who, we have low. Who, interest. Who, we have, who, ha, who has higher who has higher you know, interest rates than we do? E pretty much everybody. I mean, our Ooh, interest true. rates are on par with Turkey. I mean, we've got net, you forget about nominal rates, Brent. You got to look at real rates. Our inflation rate is much higher than the inflation rate in the Eurozone or Japan. And so if you look at real interest rates in the United States, they are much lower than they are in any other major economy. Yeah, Brent, let's go back for a moment to Peter's point about the trade deficit. Uh, because yeah. I, I think most of the viewers understand that when we've got this huge deficit, we're importing all this stuff, but the only thing we are exporting are dollars. So when we're looking at uh, you know the, the dollar cash flow decreasing because of lockdowns and maybe what's happening in China and whatnot, uh, you know that's a good point that there are a lot of dollars that are getting out into the system that otherwise wouldn't be getting out there. So do you think that's enough to put a, a kind of a, a buffer on the demand for the dollar? Or do you think that's just kind of a drop in the bucket? No, I don't think it's even, I think it's almost immaterial. Okay. So kind of a drop in the bucket yeah. there. So then yeah. what about uh, what Peter's saying with the, the, when you look at real yields, how the, the dollar is, uh, or the United States has extreme negative real rates compared to, uh, although they, from a nominal standpoint, they have high rates. Well, I mean, I would have to look at the exact comparisons, but it's not like Europe has positive real rates. I mean, they're negative real rates. They have huge inflation in Europe and they have negative rates. So you're, you're, it's not like you're gaining something by being and they have and they have no plans to stop stimulus anytime soon. So, again, it's just it, it's a it, people don't like this when I say this, but it's a relative world. You have to choose one of the fiat currencies. You don't have to like it, but if you're going to operate in the world stage, you need a fiat currency to do it. 
Right. And there's just red. no fiat why, currency can compete. Why choose okay, look, the currency of the world's biggest debtor? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Of, of no, it actually it, does. It actually does. It makes in all the sense. In your bizarro world, it does, but 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 not in the in the real world. I mean, okay. why why would you choose to own U.S. dollars when because we are flooding the world with dollars? We have no intention of ever stopping. Our, our the real U.S. economy continues to di disintegrate. The more the world allows us to live beyond our means and to continue to consume without producing, the less productive capacity we have and the more dependent we grow on the stronger economies overseas that are actually producing the stuff that Americans need. I mean, this situation wow. can't go on so this indefinitely. Is, so okay. so the, listen, that's a very good point that you just made, and I completely agree with you, 100%. Which point but was it's that? Also the truth, or, but I'm it's, sorry, but it's, the point, point that, you know, this, this can't go on forever. We're, we're running a horrible fiscal program. We've got trade deficits. It just cannot go on forever. But I think it's all, and that's an important point to make. But it's also an important point to make that Peter said this exact same thing in 2010 and 2011. And now the dollar's 20 percent higher than it was then. So I hear you. It's 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 going to end. It's going to end really, really badly for the dollar. But it ain't going to end yet because there's nowhere else to go. Brent, why was the dollar so weak between 2001 and 2008, right? Because the dollar com completely collapsed during that period of time. Uh, you know, what, what's different? Because the dollar was still what's the reserve different? currency yeah. in 2000. What's different, what's different is that was the result of the U.S. tech wreck and IPO and all that stuff. And then we did really, really loose monetary policy while the rest of the world had regular or even tight monetary policy. So capital flowed out of the United States and it went where it was better treated overseas. That's no longer the case. You're not well, treated better in Japan. You're not treated better in well, Germany. What if, You're not treated well, what better if, in Germany. You're not treated Fred, better in South Africa. Well, what if this happens? We, you've admitted that we have an inflation problem in Europe. Uh, there's an inflation problem here. Europe is more likely to do something about their problem than the United States. Why? Why? Well, why do you a, say that? Because they can as you know, a credit how can they? How, how can they? They're they're gonna they're they're in a better position as a net creditor to allow interest rates to go up. You know, then why aren't they? They, they have why more they domestic doing? savings. They they will. I mean, they they've resisted the temptation. The Bundesbank, or not the Bundesbank, the ECB has operated under the false pretense that you know, inflation was too low, and that gave them cover to keep interest rates uh, at zero or negative. Uh, but now that inflation is clearly well above their 2% you know, ceiling, they no longer have the pretext to justify this monetary policy. And I don't think the Bundesbank is going to allow the ECB to continue to look the other way as inflation is well beyond that 2% level. And so rates are far more likely to rise in Europe. Uh, the ECB is far more likely to actually pursue a tighter monetary policy then is the Federal Reserve, which is impossible to do because of the fiscal position of the United States. The U.S. government has to default on its debt if the Fed actually becomes tight. And so that's not going to happen. We have a much bigger debt bubble, I think, uh, than they have in, in, in Europe. And, you know, even if Europe just goes to low interest rates from where they are now, that's a big difference between how how negative the rates are here and the same thing in Japan. You know, I wouldn't be surprised to so, see uh, a tightening over there. You know, it, so the should, United should we, States is the last place that can tighten. Yeah. OK, so, so, so should we should we make a, should our bet this year be on rate hikes in Europe? Number of rate hikes in Europe? Compared to U.S.? I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how many hikes. I'm, I, you know, I, I more comfortable. But I'm saying you're but you're you're expecting you're expecting rate hikes in Europe, it sounds like. It, they, they may not come, but they're not going to come here either. I mean, I, you know, I just okay, think so let's, they're so, more likely they're more likely to tighten policy than the U.S. Now, nobody might tighten. They everybody might stay where they are, but inflation is going to get worse on both sides of, of of the Atlantic. But the fundamentals are still worse for the dollar than they are for the euro. Not that I think they're great for the euro. I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of the euro either. I just think on a relative basis, the dollar is, is, is worse.
And is that basically because of the trade surplus or the trade deficit? Yeah, that's that's a big part of it. I mean, yeah. I, okay, so what happens here? Let me, let me, at, let me least, ask you this at least is at least is you know producing to the extent that they consume. They're they're not dependent on the rest of the world. America completely depends. I and mean, if you think about the size of our trade deficits, we're running trade deficits now well north of a trillion dollars a year. You know, you're talking 1.1, 1.2 trillion dollars a year. Imagine what would happen to the U.S. economy if those one trillion dollars worth of goods were not here. I mean, if the shelves were empty, if there was nothing to buy. I mean, imagine how bad the inflation would be if we had, there was nothing to buy with all the money the Fed was printing. And if we couldn't okay. export all the money that we were printing, if foreigners weren't dumb enough to accept all of our paper for that stuff, their stuff, you know, what circumstances would the U.S. economy be in right now? We, we are completely dependent on the charity of the rest of the world, and that includes the charity of Europe. But I think to a greater degree, we depend on Asia than we do Europe. Yeah, Peter, do you think that uh, there is a substantial amount of demand outside the United States for the dollar because of the amount of dollar denominated debt on the balance sheets of these corporations? I mean, do you think there's something there? Because, again, if, if they don't have enough of the, the dollars coming in, assuming they don't for a moment, I know the trade deficits are, are extremely high, but assuming they don't, then they'd have to sell their local currency, buy dollars that props up the dollar artificially. So do you think there's something there? Because there's a lot of dollar denominated debt outside the U.S. Yeah, there is. But that's also a problem because that means there's a lot of dollars outside the United States. We owe all that money. I mean, and, and what happens to the U.S. when interest rates go up and we have to start paying a higher rate of interest on all the dollar denominated debt that foreigners own? I mean, people want to focus on the dollar debt that is issued by non-Americans. But what about all the dollar debt issued by Americans? Because there's a lot more of that. America borrows more in dollars than any other country. And if interest rates start to go up, our current account deficit explodes because we have to start paying all the holders of that dollar denominated debt more dollars to continue to hold that debt. And of course, once the dollar really starts to fall, they no longer want to hold that debt. Okay. So now what okay, happens when everybody who owns dollar debt is trying to get rid of it? Okay. So I guess the argument there, Brent, is that there's more treasuries that uh, foreigners own uh, on their balance sheet would be an asset uh, that exceeds the dollar liabilities on their on their balance sheet. Not a, no, that's that's a complete fallacy. It's not true. Okay. The so euro you're... dollar the euro dollar system dwarfs. There's two there's two dollar markets, and I I've, I've spoken about this several times. But there's a U.S. domestic dollar market, and there's a euro dollar market that exists outside of the United States. The amount of credit that has been extended in the euro dollar market dwarfs the, the the size of the euro dollar market dwarfs the U.S. domestic dollar market. There's just as much, if not more, there's actually more demand outside the United States for dollars than there is demand for dollars well, inside how, the United how, States. Brett, how much, so how much, do, how many dollars uh, does the world, non-U.S. debt, how much does, do foreigners owe it, it dollars to? And who do they owe those dollars to? Because it's probably they, not they, they, they probably owe them no. to each other. No, to, that's right. And that's right. And so if they default on that dollar debt, they're not defaulting on the United States. It doesn't hurt us. It hurts them. They're 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 blowing up their own reserves. If they default right, but how, on but dollar how, debt. But, but how much how much is that debt? Well, the we the bank debt and that we know of is like 26, 29 trillion, about the same. But 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 in the opaque euro dollar market where you've got these uh, bank like companies and financial institutions and that the, it's opaque and don't have to report to anybody. It, it, it's much bigger. I mean, they tried yeah, to do but, a study but, on this. But also, yes. so, but if you've got, let's say, somebody in Germany who owes yeah. dollars to somebody in Japan, right? What you're overlooking is the dollar is only a currency for the account of that debt because when the Japanese creditor gets the dollars, he sells them to get yen. He doesn't hold on to them, you know, because. If I'm in Japan and I've 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 done a deal where I've I've loaned out in U.S. dollars because we needed a, a neutral currency because I'm in Japan, the other guys in Europe, and we picked dollars as kind of like a neutral reference point. And 
the minute I get paid those dollars back, I want to get rid of them because I got to pay my, my, my local bills. I got to pay my rent. I got to pay my employees. They all want yen. So the dollar is kind of like a placeholder. It's not like the Japanese really want those dollars. They don't want the dollars. They want the yen. They just have a note that's denominated in dollars. It's very different uh, between uh, the, the U.S. Uh, borrowing and, and the rest of the world. They, they, so to say, oh, there's all this dollar denominated debt. Everybody needs dollars. They don't need dollars. They just use dollars uh, to denominate the debt. But the minute the minute the debts are repaid, the dollars are sold. Yeah, but I think he's not. talking I mean, about you're, you're, the you're, bank. You're, you're, Brent, are you you're referring? Saying- yeah, okay, the banks hold explain. the banks hold the banks hold dollar reserves. All countries hold dollar reserves because they have to hold dollar reserves. Well, you're talking about central match. banks, the nope. central banks. Yeah, Peter, I think and, and uh, commercial banks. I think, and let me chime banks. in here, Brent. I think uh, Peter's talking about if a corporation or a non-bank entity lends another non-bank entity, uh, that obviously makes a lot of sense because they have to get their currency to pay their bills. But I think uh, where the discrepancy comes in here, Peter, is that Brent is talking about if. Uh, a bank actually extends a dollar denominated loan. Let's just say a bank in the Cayman Islands extends a dollar denominated loan to XYZ Corporation in Colombia. Uh, that when those dollars are paid back, then that bank is is paying down the principal or the interest. They're not using those dollars to uh, to trade and to get their local currency to pay employees. A little bit difference with a, a non bank and a bank entity. But ultimately, too, it works the other way, Brett, because if the dollar starts to lose value, then servicing all that dollar debt becomes easier and easier and easier. In yeah. fact, it's, yeah. it gets forgiven. Totally, totally, com- totally, com- completely agree with you. And that's what that is exactly why all these countries have taken out and all these corporations have taken out all this dollar debt on the theory that the Fed was going to print all this money and that the dollar is going to lose value and they were going to make foreign currency gains. And yet, they're underwater. Everybody is underwater on all those for, loans. Well, that for taken. now, for now, you know, I mean, but, but Peter, but people have been saying this since 1985. Well, the, but I mean, the, they, they, the they wrote dollar. the dollar down. They wrote no, the but, dollar down artificially in 1985. And for the last 30 years, they've been building up these euro, these euro dollar loans again, saying any day now the dollar is going to go to zero. And it just well, keeps Brent, going higher. Think year about year. ever since we basically went off the gold standard 1971 or officially you know went off you know the what remained of it think about where the dollar has been the dollar is in a long-term bear market in 1971 you could get 360 yen for the dollar now what is it now 80 or something 90 i forget it's less than 100. uh you could buy a swiss franc for 23 cents you now need a dollar, more than a dollar, to buy a Swiss franc. So the franc has gone up fourfold against the dollar. The Deutsche Mark doesn't exist anymore, but you know it was four to one back then. I mean, if you replace it with the euro, uh, you know the dollar is much lower now against the euro than it was against the mark. Yes, but a, but a big, a big, a very, very big part of that, and I'm not saying all of it, but a very big part of that is artificial devaluation of the dollar due to the Plaza Accords. No, but the Agreed. Plaza Accord was just a few years in the 1980s. <laughs> yeah, but how far did it? There. But Peter, how far did it go in those few years? What happened to the yen? It went way down because it went way up why? in the years before. But why? And you don't. Why did it go? You but why did it go up so much? Why did it, it went go up, up so much because the Volcker before? jacked interest rates way up, and Reagan was there, and they were, and they were, you know, it was a different era. But look, the dollar got too expensive. It would have fallen anyway without the Plaza Accord. You know, you don't well, know why what would it happen. Have, why would it have fallen anyway? Yeah, that's because the, you're, you're saying that, but there's no. And in fact, look how many. If it, hold on, hold on, hold on, fact, hold on. If hold on, hold on. If it was overpriced, why did they have to artificially lower it? Why couldn't they, they just didn't let have the market to. take it they, down? They did it. But you know what, Brent? Look what happened in 1987. All the coordinated intervention. All the central banks around the world had to intervene to save the dollar. In fact, there have been many times where the dollar was on the edge of collapse when the foreign central banks were spending a tremendous amount of money to prevent it from collapsing. Remember when the dollar got down to 80 Japanese yen, I mean, it was just getting killed and there was massive intervention. And you've had all these other central banks that have come to the aid of the dollar and look at all the Forex reserves, all the, you know, the, the, the big uh, sovereign wealth funds and all these, uh, the foreign treasury bonds that have been accumulated by the Chinese or the Japanese or, the Saudis or everybody else, all of this is artificial demand 
to prop up the dollar, right? When governments, when foreign governments buy dollars, that's not a free market, that's artificial. If it was up to the free market, the dollar would have collapsed a long time ago under the weight of our trade deficits. It's all because of government manipulation that it hasn't collapsed, but of course okay. they're are not they, going to they, be able to keep it are, popped up forever. Are they manipulating currencies and bond markets in Europe and Japan and China and Australia and England? Or is yes, this just course. the United States? Yes, and a okay. lot of it, they're, they're, they're propping up the dollar. In fact, most of Japan's monetary mistakes, and in fact, China's too, have all been to try to keep the dollar from falling because everybody why, why do, wants why do to they, preserve. Why, why, why do they want to keep the dollar from falling when because it would they, help them to let it fall? They could pay off they, their, they, they could make their foreign currency gains. No, because they're still under the delusion that a weak currency is good because it helps their exports. They're looking so you at think their they're exports. Hold on. Okay, so you just you just made a great point. You just fantastic point. I'm glad we got to this. So you think that all of a sudden these central bankers that all went to the same schools as the people at the Fed, they're all of a sudden going to get religion and turn into Austrian economists rather than remain Keynesian? And it's they're going to change they're their not policies? Gonna, they're not going to all of a sudden get religion. Religion is going to be forced on them by okay. price and, by prices going up. They're, they've reached so the we'll, end of their but it'll world. Be forced, but it will be forced on them, but not in the United States. So we'll be able to withstand the religious forces, but the ECB won't and the Bank of Japan won't. No, no. I mean, eventually we may have to do something too, but the problem is the consequences for us are far more horrific because of the you. nature of our I, economy, the okay, bubble nature okay, of our economy on. and, and how, how we're so dependent. Because think about it. All right, so what if interest rates have to go up to 10%? Let's just say 10%, half of what they were in 1980. Okay, okay. which country is least likely to afford to pay 10% on its debts? Every other country except for the United States. No, so how will be, the United States could pay 10%? So absolutely. A, They'll, they, they will just print it and well, pay it in the rest of the world. But if we just business. print it, if we just print it, it's worthless. We can't no, print no, no, no. that much money. But, but, uh, here, the, here, reason, the reason we the, hold on, this is this is but this is really important here. This okay. is really important. The reason we would print it is because there would be demand for it. We wouldn't just print it out of just for the heck of it. The reason you print money is to relieve deflationary pressures. Well, well, that's the. De, 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 oh, deflation. am I wrong? Am, no, am well, I wrong? Well, it, you're talking about for asset prices, but I mean, no, 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 they're no, trying to on, sustain on, asset on. bubbles. Just, not it, on, Brent, just to explain your point, give us an example. This is okay. The reason that the Fed has printed "quote unquote" two trillion dollars over the last twenty months is because there was so much demand for dollars, they had to print it. If they would not have printed it, we would not be having inflation, we would be in a depression. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're talking about they're, asset the, the prices. Print, Q, no, 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 Q, I'm talking about, you're talking how they're just gonna print the money and it's gonna become worthless. The reason that they print start printing it to begin with is there is demand for it and everybody's hoarding it and they got to get new liquidity into the system so that people no, they're, can they're, use it. No, the reason they so, are printing dollars is A, because the US government is running huge deficits and it's the only way they can get the dollars is through the Federal Reserve creating them because they're not getting them from taxpayers. Both, so that's both, one okay, reason. Guys, okay, both, guys, I got reason is to prop yep. up asset prices. It's because asset prices would have fallen. All right, guys, so we had a little technical difficulty there. I apologize, but where we left off I believe is uh, Brent, you're kind of making the point that the United States is in a better position than uh, the rest of the world as far as uh, because they have the world reserve currency, there's going to be more demand for those dollars inside and outside and use the point of quantitative easing as an example of needing more dollar liquidity. And then Peter was saying it's actually the opposite in his view. So uh, why don't we start by if you could just give me kind of a one minute uh, articulation of your view and give me that example of quantitative easing you're talking about, then Peter can yeah. kind of push back on that. Yeah, I, I think the point I want to make is I, I think a lot of people get cause and effect messed up when they're talking about monetary policy and what it does to the value of a, of a currency. Um, the whole point of QE is to relieve currency pressure or currency deflationary pressure. You wouldn't be adding supply if there was no demand for it. So the reason you're adding supply is to meet that increased demand and not allow a currency to rise uncontrollably and wipe everybody out. Now, I don't actually like these policies. 
I'm not somebody who likes what the Federal Reserve and the other central banks around the world are doing, but I understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. But and so, you know, if they're going to print another hundred trillion, it's going to be because there's a credible amount of deflationary pressure that they're trying to relieve. They're not just going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, we're going to print $20 trillion just for the hell of it. They will do it as a result of a crisis. And the crisis will be a rising dollar and deflationary pressure, not falling dollar and inflationary pressure. So, Brent, when you're talking about printing money, are you just referring about the, the or talking about I, I should, I just, I should just, I, 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 Yeah, I should just say QE. I shouldn't say printing. QE. QE. Okay, so just the Fed expanding their balance sheet. So you think they're expanding their balance sheet to relieve the dollar pressure outside of the United States? Both, 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 both. Okay, so how are we having dollar pressure inside the United States if prices are going up? Are you looking at asset prices? Meaning that if they're not doing QE, then asset prices are going to deflate. Let's, let's, let's go back to March of 2020. Asset prices were not rising. Asset prices around the world, every market were falling. Every market. If you can find me a security that was up in the week, the second week of March 2020, I, I would like to see it. Okay, because so your everything point. was falling because everybody, the whole world needed dollars. And the QE response was a response to that dollar demand. Okay, so more asset prices, uh, correct? Because yeah, I because if, if, if asset prices collapse, then businesses go bankrupt, jobs disappear, then, then shelves are really empty because you have a depression. Right. Okay. So Peter, what, what's your position there? Well, I mean, first of all, the dollar was up, but in the scheme of things uh, and relative to how much the dollar has gone up during you know, past crises, uh, the dollar's gain was, was not that great. And in fact, there are many periods of time where the dollar was weakening uh, against the euro or the Swiss franc or the yen during those periods of time. So it might have been strengthening against uh, some other currencies, emerging market currencies, but against uh, certain currencies, the dollar was actually weakening. Uh, so I didn't see a lot of dollar strength there. But again, Brent, what you have to understand is- the Peter, world, there's not one currency in the world that was up against the dollar in, in March of 2020. Oh, I don't remember the exact- the, Well, the exact you, 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 you it, find, it, you, you find, if you can find me one and you send it to me, I'll buy you dinner. Yes. <laughs> All right, Pete. Let's it let may, Peter it, continue. And, and if the dollar was up against the yen or the franc, it would have been a very uh, incremental- uh, amount. I mean, not like what you would have seen back in, in, in the 80s, the period that you're talking about, or even what we saw in the aftermath of the 08 financial crisis. But you have to understand that what gives a currency value ultimately is the products that are produced by the nation issuing that currency, because none of these fiat currencies uh, are backed by anything anymore, right? That's why they're fiat currencies. There's no gold there. So what gives a currency value is the goods that are produced by those the people in that country. And so the demand for that currency is a function of demand to buy the products that are being produced. And as I said earlier, we have record trade deficits. The world does not need dollars to buy American products because we're not making the products that the world wants to buy. We're not making the products that Americans want to buy. Americans want to buy the products that are made in China and other parts of the world. So on a fundamental basis, the dollar should be very, very weak uh, given our, our trade imbalance. What's been propping up the dollar is simply demand for U.S. financial assets. And again, there should be no real demand for U.S. Treasuries because the negative yields are enormous and nobody wants to lose money on purpose. Uh, so when people realize that those negative yields are going to persist indefinitely and they're going to get even more negative, there's no demand there. And I think demand for buying shares of Google and Amazon and Netflix and all these stocks is going to go away. I mean, the world already owns too much. The world is already overinvested in an overvalued U.S. stock market. So I think demand for U.S. financial assets is going to decline over time. But American demand for foreign goods is not going to decline. We're more <laughs> dependent than ever for foreign goods. So we're headed for a collapse. And as far as what you're saying, if we go into a, a stagflationary environment where a weakening dollar causes more domestic inflation, which actually destroys consumer buying power, pushes up unemployment. Then we have a weak U.S. stock market. There's falling demand for U.S. 
uh, dollars because of inflation and a weak U.S. asset market. So if we go into a period of time where the dollar is falling, consumer prices are rising, the economy is in recession, according to you, the Fed is going to start withdrawing all the money from circulation and raising interest rates because the demand for dollars overseas is falling. Even though we're in a, a recession with rising unemployment, you think the Federal Reserve is going to react to that by shrinking the money supply along with the declining external demand for dollars and raising interest rates, despite the fact that we're in a massive recession. Okay, so basically doing the opposite. So I think what he's referring to there, Brent, is you're talking about the Fed providing liquidity by uh, quantitative easing, use the example of March. So Peter's saying, okay, well, if this comes to fruition with stagflation, do you also believe that the Fed would do the opposite and actually can uh, contract the money supply, at least base money, uh, because they acknowledge that there's too much money floating around. I think that's kind of the position. It's not my base case, but I don't rule it out. I, th I think that if anybody can get away with raising rates on a consistent basis, anybody can do one rate hike here, one rate hike there. But if any if any sovereign can get away with, uh, with and I, again, I don't think that we're going back to normalization of interest rates. But if anybody can come close, it's the United States versus somebody else. And let me here. Here is why. And I've said this several times before, and I'm going to say it again because I honestly really believe it. I think Peter is probably the best person in the world at explaining why or where we're going to end up and why we're going to end up there. I think everything he just elucidated when he said ultimately, da 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 da, fundamentally, da, I think he's absolutely right. It's just that I think that road to get there is longer than everybody else. And the reason that it's longer to get there is because all these other countries have problems of their own. And we do not live, and, and Peter is the best person at explaining free market dynamics, but we do not live in a free market. I'm sorry, we don't. I wish we did, but we don't. And they're going to continue to push buttons and spin plates and put in regulations. And, and the U.S., for like it or not, has many advantages that the rest of the world doesn't. And when push comes to shove, they're not just going to relinquish their military, economic, and social currency that they have in the world. They, they, will, they, they will use every tool in their arsenal to defend the dollar as the global reserve currency. Now, it will end really, really, really badly, but it's going to end for others before it ends for us. So Brent, Peter, I think, would say, well, the, I acknowledge that they have those advantages, the United States, but they, their disadvantages are even greater from the standpoint of the trade deficit because we don't produce any stuff. If we uh, lived in a free, if we lived in a free market, I would completely agree with Peter, but we don't. Okay, Peter, what, what's your rebuttal for that? To the extent that your point is that the advantage America has is that all the other countries are screwed up too, and they all have problems, and America benefits from the fact that other nations have problems, I will concede that point. I mean, that has been happening. There is a reflexive response that when everybody is worried about their own problems, they kind of seek out the dollar as a safe haven, ignoring the fact that the problems in America are actually worse than the problems in their own country, right? So they're jumping from the frying pan into the fire. They just don't realize it. And so, yes, America benefits from that. But because of that, America's problems have gotten so much larger than everybody else's because we, we have all this extra rope that we've been able to use to, to hang ourselves with in that everybody has problems and so the, the world loans America more money and America now goes deeper into debt and we can keep on spending more of that borrowed money to make it look like we don't have problems, but we have even bigger problems, except the world is ignoring those problems, but they will not ignore them indefinitely. And the other point is the, the burden that America places on the global economy gets greater and greater every year. We are a very expensive habit that the world is financing. The, the world has to pay for 300 million you know, Americans, the majority of which are unproductive. Americans are out shopping, spending money they didn't earn, buying stuff they didn't make. That exacts a heavy burden on the rest of the world. So not only does the world have to deal with their own self-made problems, at the same time, they are burdened by having to support the United States. So at some point, 
it's, they have to recognize it's in their self-interest to stop doing this, making their, 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 their burden that much heavier by, by, by having to carry us around on their back. So we are reaching a point of this whole system collapsing. And if you can look at how much we've antagonized the world, how much we've literally bitten the hands that feed us, look at the fight we pick with China, look what we're doing with Russia. I mean, we are pushing the world in the direction that they should have gone in anyway. The world should completely move away from this US dollar-based system from which America is the only beneficiary. And we exceed and receive an enormous benefit from this exorbitant privilege at the expense of the rest of the world. Yeah, and, Peter, I think know, that Brent's point, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brent, would be that he completely agrees with you. Uh, but it's a, a matter of timing that maybe in 10 or 15, 20 years, that's going to be possible because there's going to be an alternative to the dollar. But until there is an alternative, there's always the an dollar. alternative. I mean, there, there's gold. Well, I mean, anybody I can think, use gold instead of dollars. No one's forcing anybody to use dollars. Well, yeah, this, right. this, is a, this, is a, this is a perfect transition to this point because you and I both agree that everybody should own gold. I mean, and it's hard for me to believe I'm saying this, but I'm actually probably long term even more bullish on gold than Peter is, which is hard to say, but I think long term I might be. But one thing that Peter just said, and part of the reason that I pound the table as hard as I do on the dollar is not because I want people to go sell their gold or sell their silver and go buy dollars. That, that's not the point of doing what I do. The point of doing what I do is I have met so many people who completely understand Peters and other people you know, who, who have criticized fiat currency and central bank action, who completely understand that this is a Ponzi scheme that is going to end, the fiat currencies are going to lose value. And so what they do is they rush out and they sell their all their portfolios and they put all their money in gold because the dollar is going to collapse and it's going to be devastation. And they've been doing it for 50 years now. And people have gotten ruined doing that. And I don't I want them to own some gold, but I don't want them to put all of their money into one thing because the dollar is going to collapse, because even though that collapse will very likely happen at some point, it's very unlikely it's going to happen in the next couple of years. And you, I, I, well, and, you know, and, and I don't want them. To, I don't want them to go out and get into the spot. I mean, I've met so many people at so many conferences who are 60, 70 years old. They're either in retirement or close to retirement and their portfolios and their net eggs, nest eggs are made up of bullion and 60 to 70 percent gold miners. And it's just, yeah. it's, been, yeah. it's been devastating yeah. for them. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, to, to be to be fair to Peter, he I mean, I've listened to. No, no, I'm not, I'm not my finger. Way, but, I'm not, yeah, Peter no, always I'm, I'm, says maybe about 10 percent, you know, depending I, on, I on you. who you are. I'm, saying, I'm, I'm not blaming Peter for this. I'm just telling you, I have talked to so many people who totally understand the long term picture of fiat right. currency. And as a result, they go out and they go all in on some kind of a real asset or precious metal or Bitcoin or whatever it is, because the dollar is going to collapse tomorrow. Yeah, well, if, if, people, like, it's not if that they're, simple. If, yeah, if they're ahead. buying Bitcoin, it's not because of anything I said. Uh, and I certainly <laughs> I certainly I certainly haven't encouraged people to stay all in gold. Uh, I've, I've told people because of my view on fiat currencies to be invested in equities. Um, I like buying companies that have real assets, real businesses, real cash flow, real dividends. I prefer investing outside the United States because I believe that we have problems that are uniquely bad, uh, worse than other countries. I don't just randomly throw money all around the world. I try to invest in countries that I think have better uh, macroeconomic fundamentals, and I'm a value-oriented investor, so I, I'm not buying all the momentum and all the hype. And so, yes, my strategy has underperformed over the last decade. It, it underperformed dramatically in the decade prior. So people following my advice in 2000 to 2011 to buy uh, foreign stocks uh, emerging market stocks, commodity type stocks did much better than people who stayed in the S&P or the NASDAQ. Now, that wasn't the case for the decade that, that just ended, uh, but we still managed decent returns. I mean, we weren't just sitting in gold waiting for everything to collapse. I was just buying in stock markets that I believed were better long term fundamental values. But I also see a hedge against the dollar if I am owning assets in other countries denominated in foreign currencies. So even my foreign stock portfolios, if the dollar collapses, those foreign stocks will be good hedges at that time uh, against a weak dollar. Now, they won't be as good a hedge maybe as the gold mining stocks will be at that time, 
But leading up to that time, uh, they're a better hedge because you have a operating business that's generating uh, dividends and people are buying. It's, they're still stocks. You don't need Armageddon. The U.S. doesn't have to collapse uh, for the rest of the world uh, to do well. I mean, they could do well in tandem. And there have been periods of time and, you know, where all the markets are going up. Uh, and, and that's what's been happening more recently, except the U.S. market has gone up more uh, than foreign markets. That's why I've said it's so overvalued unprecedentedly unprecedentedly overvalued relative to emerging markets or even developed markets outside the U.S., which is another reason that demand for U.S. stocks is going to wane over time because they're so expensive. Yeah, uh, so even I if think nothing that, wrong goes, even if you don't have anything, a big problem, just you're going to revert to the mean. And where, where are all these trade surpluses going to go if foreigners don't want to buy our stocks? And we know they don't want to buy our bonds. Nobody wants to buy our bonds. Right. So I think the uh, common denominator, interestingly enough, is you guys both like gold uh, in this environment, uh, but a, a prudent amount as far. And you both like a diversified portfolio that includes stocks. Uh, Brent might like U.S., Peter probably outside the United States. And I think that both you guys uh, see future consumer price inflation in the United States actually going up. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Peter has that view. And, and Brent, I think you have that view as well, that because most people see you as a dollar bull. They don't realize that, that you see the dollar going up against other currencies, but you see it going down against consumer goods and services in the United States, probably moving into 2022. And so yeah, I, mean, I, th I, th I think we're probably in a, in a inflationary period that will be punctuated by moments of pure deflationary terror. Which then will then are, be? Are, are you talking about consumer month. prices or asset prices or both? Both. Okay. Both. Okay. Both. Yeah, All I right. don't think we're going to get to a point where people are terrorized by consumer prices dropping or consumer prices not rising enough. That that was always a, a false problem. It was a straw man created by central banks to justify their cheap monetary policies. The only deflation that scares central bankers is assets. It's stocks going down. It's bonds going that's, down. It's that's, real that's estate true. going down. That's um, true initially, but if you if you let asset prices go down far enough, which they won't, but if they do, then you will get a depression, and in that in that scenario, you get consumer price deflation. Right, but well. consumer prices falling in that scenario is a good thing. Why you wouldn't want them not oh, to I, fall? I, you I need them to fall. You. Yeah, I think I you agree. agree so. I agree. With you. Yeah, I, I so I think that completely agree with you. Yeah, I think the one thing that you guys uh, kind of disagree on is the the magnitude of the advantages and the disadvantages for the United States and then other countries. So I know we're kind of running short on time, guys. Uh, Brent, can you start just by telling me what you think the United States biggest advantage is and then their biggest disadvantage? And then maybe the same question for countries outside of the United States that would uh, bring you to your view? Well, at a really fundamental basis, the biggest resource that the United States has is its location on the globe. Um, okay. It's got, it's got the best land mass. You know, it can feed itself. It can produce, if it wanted to, it could produce everything it needs. It's got, you know, a coast on three oceans. Um, it's just, it won the geographic lottery. You know? Okay. And so, and that, and that's, that's, that's our biggest advantage. And then the fact that we're the superpower and we have the global reserve currency kind of goes along with that. Okay. Um, disadvantage. The, 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 the biggest disadvantage is we have just absolute idiots in Washington. Um, okay. you know, <laughs> I, I mean, I think we all agree ones, on that one. <laughs> right. Um, and I think, I think what, I think the advantage in the long, in the medium to long term, the advantage that the other countries have over the United States, not in the short term, but in the medium to long term, the advantage they have is they don't have it as good as that we have it. So they can deal with adversity better than we can. And they know how to make things and they're already producing things. So, you know, we're going to have to kind of relearn both of those things. We're going to have to learn how to deal with adversity and we're going to have to learn how to make things again. And then what's their biggest disadvantage in the in the kind of. Oh, the, the the biggest disadvantage that the rest of the world have is they have a lot of dollar based debt and they can't print dollars to, to finance it. OK, Peter, what do you think? Well, you know, I think our biggest advantage and our biggest disadvantage are the same thing, and that is the reserve currency status of the dollar. OK, I mean, it's an advantage because it's enabled us to 
basically get away with murder. We've been able to live far beyond our means. Uh, and you know, we've been able to make believe that we have a genuine economy uh, when we don't. We have a gigantic bubble. And without the ability to export the money that we print, none of this would be possible. But at the same time, because we've been able to uh, exploit that advantage, that has put us in this vulnerable position where to the extent that we ever lose that ability, the whole house of cards comes collapsing down because right. we have built an economy on that foundation that is not going to be there forever. And when we are confronted with reality, uh, it is a, a huge implosion in our standard of living. And especially when you look at the, the opinion of the electorate, I mean, the degree to which America has moved uh, from, you know, supportive of capitalism and, and the free markets to a belief in socialism and a centrally planned economy, when we finally have to pay the piper for years and years of this central planning and monetary policy and all the mistakes that were made by, by the idiots in Washington, including the idiots at the Federal Reserve, the public is not going to blame government. The public is going to blame capitalism. They're going to blame businesses. They're going to blame Wall Street. And they are going to look for, to government for solutions. They're going to look to make a huge government even bigger. And so we have a very, very dangerous path ahead of us. And, you know, I, I think the key difference, you know, between uh, Brent and I, as far as an investor is concerned, if we both agree on the end game that the U.S. is really screwed the dollar is going to crash. A day of reckoning is coming. Brent just believes that that day of reckoning is going to come much later than I believe. And right. so far, I mean, he's been right because it's already been delayed for a tremendous amount of time. The question is, do you want to press your luck? Do you want to bet that we can continue to kick this can down the road for another 10 years and that the $30 trillion national debt can grow to $100 trillion and everything is still going to be fine? that the Fed's balance sheet can go uh, from 8 trillion to 20 or 30 trillion or 50 trillion, wherever it's gonna be, and we're still gonna be okay, right? It, we're, you're still gonna be fine living in the US and the rest of the world is gonna continue to support this. Because remember, the, the, the bigger the problems get, right? The more our debt grows, the bigger the burden the rest of the world has to bear to finance that debt. But if you think that we can continue to, to, to postpone the day of reckoning, then, you know, you can invest, you know, in dollars and U.S. assets. But why take that chance? Right. <laughs> I, I would just err on the side of, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to play for the end game. And if Brent is right, I still make money. The problem is, if Brent is wrong, and you're invested all in U.S. dollars, all in U.S. treasuries, and the crisis comes sooner then Brent thinks you're wiped out. You, you've got nothing. If, if it happens later than I think, I'm still okay. You know, I'm, my portfolio is not going to go away. So I'm secure. I can sleep well at night knowing that I'm not just trying to time this thing. That yeah. since I know how it's going to end up and I don't know how we're going to get there, and neither does Brent. We're just trying to guess how we think we're going we're gonna to arrive at the destination. But nobody knows for sure who's right. That's why I just think my approach is more prudent because I don't know the timing, but I do think I know how it ends up. And since I know that for sure, and that's the only thing I can know for sure, I'm going to have my portfolio set up so that when that eventually happens, you know, I, I, I prosper. I, I, I come out a winner. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so it's all a timing issue. It's really a timing issue, and that depends on the individual investor. And are they trying to just hit a home run in the next two or three months? Or are they trying to play for an end game that could materialize in five years, 10 years, uh, something like that? So I think that's really what it boils down to. Gentlemen, I sincerely appreciate your time. Peter, you invited both of us over to your place in Puerto Rico for that Christmas party. That was absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you again for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. I yeah, said, I'm, glad, I'm glad we're doing this, uh, this uh, discussion remotely because if we were standing in the same room, you know, my on stature, I lose. I had no idea you guys were so tall. I mean, because I, George, I never even met George in person. And the only time I ever saw Brett, he was seated at a chair. 
And so okay. I had no idea <laughs> that you guys were, were so tall. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll have I mean, I'm it. not a short guy. I'm just average. I'm 5'11". I'm a normal height. <laughs> but I, you guys are almost ready to play basketball. Yeah, we'll have the editor throw in that picture for the audience. And just so well, you that guys picture, know. It yeah, was funny because I, I looked on your Twitter because somebody was like, gee, I didn't know Peter was that tall. Yeah, yeah. I had a, I, my living room. My living room is sunk in. And so I had a I had these guys go down a step. So they and I was standing on the floor and they were sunk in about six inches. There you go. So that's, and that's the how we story. that's how we leveled it out. We had a level playing field, but I had I had a, I had a rig it. Yeah, that like was the, a good. It was like a good. Central it was, banks. Yeah, it was like it was, the central it was, banks. It was, it was a good picture. It was a good picture. Oh uh, yeah, that's the backstory. Well, guys, <laughs> uh, thanks again for your time, and you guys have an amazing New Year's, right. and we'll see you in 2022. Bye, guys. Right, take care. Ha Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, everybody. Hi, guys. I'd like to invite each and every one of you to the next Rebel Capitalist Live event. If you are a fan of the Rebel Capitalist show, I guarantee you, you will love the live event. The next one is Houston, where you can meet and listen to speakers, all your favorites from the Rebel Capitalist show. People such as Dr. Ron Paul, Chris Cole, Lynn Alden, just to name a few. If you want to check out the rest of the speaker list and find out how you can attend, we'll put a link in the description below, or you can just go to rebelcapitalistlive.com. This is an event where you can learn to build wealth and thrive in a world of out-of-control central banks and big governments. But it's not just about building wealth. It's about increasing your freedom and networking with like-minded individuals, fellow rebel capitalists. It's an amazing event. I know you'll absolutely love it. Check out rebelcapitalistlive.com, and I will see you in Houston.